hundreds of thousands of people from Kolkata replied that I am from Kolkata and I can relate to it. It's getting murdered in front of my eyes. I am trying to rebuild a civilization. I am not building just an economy. Yeah. So building a highway and rebuilding the Ayodhya temple are a part of the same agenda. Why did people elect Jyoti Basu for the socialist government? People elect all kinds of people for yeah. all kinds of reasons. Yeah. Question is why did they re-elect him? Yeah. My view is why shouldn't Indians be billionaires? We are one sixth of the yeah. world's population. One sixth of the world's billionaires should live in India. I was recently in US in Los Angeles. There's a summit called Montgomery Summit held by Montgomery family, which is a billionaire family. So every slide had India at its forefront. Absolutely. So that is a change. We could have done this a generation ago, maybe two generations yeah. ago, but we didn't because our aspiration was that we are rich. If you must dream, surely you should dream to be Elon Musk or Mukesh Ambani. Why yeah. did you dream to be Joint Secretary? Yeah, are you not dreaming to be Sachin and Vinny Bansal's of Flipkart? I still think way too many young kids who have so much energy, etc., are wasting their time basically trying to crack the UPSC. Yes. If they put the same energy into doing something else, we would be winning more Olympic gold medals. We would be seeing better movies being made. We'd see better doctors, entrepreneurs, scientists, and so on. So I would say it's a it's a waste of time. This is Sadhat Alwalia. Welcome to the Neon Show, Sanjeev Sanyal sir. So good to have you back on the show. It's a pleasure. Thank you so much. Your first episode on Neon Show received tremendous response. Almost at eight hundred thousand views on the main episode. Few shots have crossed one million each, and the audience wanted back on the show. Thank you so much for coming back. I'm so glad that we could make it happen. It's a pleasure. So, would like to start with what are the different things that you are now part of? Right, it's been almost four five months since our last conversation. So I mean, obviously, my day job, which is my primary activity, is uh, running the economy. Yeah. So I, as you know, I'm a, I'm an economic advisor to the prime minister, and so that takes up much of my time. Um, I also also have an interest in uh, uh, writing history books, as you know. So I've not written a book recently, but I have do give lectures and so on. And one of those books, uh, Revolutionaries, is being converted into an Amazon Prime uh, series. So that is something on the side. Um, I'm also trying to build, by the way, a wooden ship, okay, based on a fifth-century uh, AD design, uh, which is a Gupta era design uh, of a ship uh, uh, from the Indian Ocean region, uh, and it will be built on the original uh, sort of uh, 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 concept. So uh, there will be no nails in it; it will be stitched together, and uh, it will have obviously all the sails, and it will not even have a rudder; it will be using a trailing oar. Okay. And the idea is to build this, which is being done in um, Goa as we speak. And the next year, when it comes on stream, then uh, with the help of the navy, I'm going to attempt to sail this first to Oman and then to Indonesia. Amazing! We we'll look forward to it. <laughs> so our audience loved our conversation about Kolkata last time, and they are all asking more details on it. Like last time, you mentioned the word Kolkata didn't die; it was murdered. Hmm. And our audience just latched onto it because. Hundreds of thousands of people from Kolkata replied, shared on comments that I am from Kolkata, or I have visited Kolkata, stayed in Kolkata for twenty years, and I can relate to it. It's getting murdered in front of my eyes, right? So, just want to go back to the history of it, where it all started with maybe Chief Minister Jyoti Basu, yeah. and in nineteen forty-seven, as you mentioned in the few interviews, it was the largest hub, the largest city across Asia, like after Japan, maybe. So, um. Yeah, I mean, when I was born, as I mentioned, Kolkata was uh, even in 1970, it was India's biggest city. It was the biggest commercial and industrial hub. Um, it was culturally, politically, a very vibrant place. Uh, indeed, before independence, it was even more important because it, of course, was a capital till uh, uh, 1912. Actually, effectively into the 1930s, because even though the capital shifted, it continued to be the main hub. And it produced all these greats within a few generations. I mean, um, Vivekanand, um, uh, Sri Aurobindo, uh, Netaji, Rabindranath, Rabindranath Tagore. Tagore, and by the way, many of these people knew each other very well. So it's uh, so it's within a, a couple of generations, and this huge. And by the way, there were huge industries. Beng Bengalis, by the way, were famous as scientists. uh uh as a businessman the original marwadi came and the originally marwadi uh, success came from kolkata not from their original homeland in Raj uh, rajasthan so the birlas originally made their money there so this was a real driver and then it all fell apart and this is important to understand because when one thing falls apart which is let's say you decide that you know 
uh, you, you're going to for whatever socialist kind of reasons you're going you're going to wreck the economy be very clear that everything else gets wrecked as well so there is no such thing as a, a vibrant um, cultural hub which is not also an economic hub so this is important because this is also in the context you know many people ask me why do you do work in so many areas why are you working in history why are you building this ship why are you uh, also working on the why don't you just focus on this yeah they have completely misunderstood what we are trying to do in the end i am trying to rebuild a civilization i am not building just an economy the economy is a part of it but the overall purpose is rebuilding the civilization so building a highway and rebuilding the ayodhya temple are a part of the same agenda and they cannot be understood separately from each other and by the way all civilizations that go through a renaissance or a rebirth have this phenomena the europe for example you talked about it yes yeah so if you look at the 13 late 1300s 1400s what happens in europe in northern italy not even in all of europe in small area northern italy a whole small group of relatively small towns go through this explosion um and you have florence for example producing this amazing art venice produces this amazing art but in fact neither of those is actually their their real business is not art it's actually in the case of florence it's finance right they banking they what is their great invention it is not uh, art it is actually double entry bookkeeping uh, venice's great successor maritime trade it is the stock exchange and so all the art is actually a sub uh a thing that sort of happens on the side as a result of this when you have wealth these things are the side no i that is precisely what i'm trying to tell you that is the wrong way to think about it what really is happening is an opening of mind an opening of aspiration which is manifesting in different ways so the same people who were funding the art were also doing the banking and also do it uh, sailing the shores and by the way this entire phenomena that i just mentioned starts from northern italy rapidly spread it goes to um, the, the the it goes to the netherlands it goes to the uh, britain it goes to spain so the same people who are listening to um shakespeare write his plays and his first actual shakespearean plays for the, done for the first time the elizabethan england are also the people who sank the armada Uh, it's francis drake watch must have watched those shakespearean plays he also is the guy who goes and circumnavigates uh, the world so, uh, it's the same people who set up the first east india company uh, uh, same thing is going on meanwhile in the netherlands so what i'm trying to say is it is not surprising that kolkata was the hub of everything because it's very often were the same people doing all these different things they knew each other so it's really a opening of mind that happened and it's called the bengal renaissance in the same way as you talk about the european renaissance so when it went into decline it was a closing of mind and the closing of mind happened didn't just happen in business and in commerce it also happened in science at about the same time it happened in culture it happened in uh, ev every sphere of uh, human activity so it is extraordinary that not only did you know the birlas and all these people leave uh, kolkata and set up shop in mumbai and other places it is also the case that kolkata has never produced again somebody of the caliber of satyajit ray or rabindranath tagore or swami vivekanand or netaji subhash bose or sri aurobindo or uh, acharya jagadish chandra bose or any number of other names i can give you it just didn't produce anybody of that caliber when once things began to unwind everything unwound and what caused like like why did people elect jyoti basu or the socialist government in the first place so you know people elect all kinds of people for yeah. all kinds of reasons yes yeah. the question is why did they reelect him yes yeah. because having elected him it was quite obvious what he was doing yeah yeah even i remember in his first term which was i think 77 to whatever 82 or whatever yeah. the first term whenever he got elected um he already had carried out the mauri jhapi massacre yeah he had already begun to shut down um the uh the business businesses yeah. uh, he already was mismanaging electricity supply so so that you know i remember growing up uh, doing my homework essentially by lantern and candle light you know people have this thing ki mere pitaji bahut garib the and then he would sit under a, you know would do his homework by a kerosene lamp and all that 
I also did uh, my homework by kerosene lamp. Not because I came from a poor family. I came from a solidly middle class family. But because there was no electricity. And this was before the days of when generators were uh, commonly available. So it was a... After, the question is, why did they keep getting him back despite lack of performance? Yeah. You know, you can try out anybody once. Why do you keep... Re now, some part of it was, of course, electoral mal malpractice... Uh, booth capturing was converted into a art form. But I would argue that even more important than that was a poverty of aspiration. If your society aspires that the highest form of life is a union leader or a, you know, uh, uh, an Adda intellectual, yeah. uh, what in Kolkata is called a Natel, uh, and, you know, that is your aspiration that you are sitting around smoking and having, uh, uh, sipping your old monk and, uh, you know, passing judgment on the rest of the world rather than doing anything. And smoking throughout the day. At yeah, you can smoke. I personally have no problem <laughs> with either of them, your, your health. But point of the matter, that is the aspiration yeah. of the society. If Mrinal Sen movies are the aspiration yes. of your society, then do not complain that that is what you get. Yeah. And uh, suddenly from being the aspiration of society to being a scientist, right? By electing, and you mentioned it's a complex world. Once you elect the wrong kind of government, you set wrong kind of aspirations. And it's just No, it's the other way around. That's the point I'm making yeah. to you repeatedly. So the first, it is not the government that causes yeah. this problem. It's the poverty of aspiration. It is the poverty of aspiration that leads you to these governments. The, okay. Ultimately, every people get the leader they deserve. And, and where If you deserve, if you want to elect... Yeah. Uh, you know, a Lalu Yadav, yeah. then you do not expect anything else as the outcome. And where did, do people get this poverty of aspiration? So, th I mean, this is a huge uh, debate, a sociological debate. Other people can work on it. But it happens to every people at certain points in time. So, some cycles are short, some are long. But if you look at, uh, say, um, you, the West... All right, uh, There was a time, whether you like it or not, they did conquer the whole world. Yeah. Okay, uh, brutal as it may have been, it is also quite extraordinary that you know a small country like uh, Britain ruled over us. Seventy percent of the world. Yeah, and you had uh, even more tiny country, uh, Netherlands controlled Indonesia and South Africa and all kinds of other places, Sri Lanka. So you ha you have to grant it to these guys that they were willing to take these things, uh, these huge risks, and they they had this sort of scale of thought. Uh, it, it is the Europeans did create much of a modern society, the scientific uh, breakthroughs and so on. Uh, and the same thing happened with America in, the, in, in much of the 20th century. Uh, they aspired to go to the moon. Um, they aspired to create all the technologies that we today create. Then at some point in time, their aspiration shrank to which gender they wanted to have. And so uh, I can assure you that the politics you are now seeing in uh, in America is a direct reflection of the poverty of their aspirations. And I can completely now relate and understand what you are trying to say. First, people choose their heroes and then they create their societies. Yes, absolutely. You ultimately become the heroes that you choose. So when, if your heroes are, uh, you know... Union leaders. Union <laughs> leaders, then you'll get union yeah. leaders. If, if, if you, if your, uh, you know, great economists are... Uh, basically uh, glorifying poverty, then don't complain that you get poverty. But because in each one of these things, an economy arises out of it. You know, so you will get uh, an, you know, uh, 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 an entire povertarian system will emerge out of it. You'll get uh, NGOs that will fund research that talks about certain kinds of uh, poverty, uske liye paisa aega, then that money will be utilized. Now, supposing it begins to actually solve poverty, that's a problem. Because your business model is based on perpetuating poverty. It's like, uh, I remember, there was a theory that Englishmen used to pay snake holders or people who used to catch snake. So now people started breeding snakes. Yes, and so I'll give you one example on which I have written myself very recently. A newspaper article appeared recently in a leading uh, uh, newspaper in India. And then it was carried in similar kind of ways in others as well that many millions of kids in India are zero food kids, okay, zero food infants. So, they're babies, basically 6 to 12 months old, 
uh, 6 to 24 months or whatever they were called zero food infants okay and there are so many millions of them and then there was a this thing was based on a study that was published uh, which also mentions you know zero food so i wonder look if there are so many millions of kids who are getting zero food then she should be they shouldn't be alive even yeah. so how are they even alive yeah. so i dug into this and by the way i've written this as an article in swarajya so other people who want to read it can so what i discovered that it wasn't actually zero food what was going on so there were these babies who in the 24 hours before the survey was taken had not been fed anything other than breast milk okay now breast milk is food in fact we have a huge campaign in india to encourage mothers to breastfeed their kids okay now supposing a child who's 7 months old mostly is fed on breast milk yeah. but for the previous 24 hours has not been fed whatever porridge or something then according to this survey he or she would be a zero food baby now of course there are millions of such babies in this country right is it a bad thing no in fact we encourage mothers to feed the uh, breastfeed their babies and yet this was being set up in in a way that was suggesting that there is mass starvation of babies in the country which is absolutely not the case i mean there may be nutritional problems but mass starvation is not the problem and yet you were setting this up so i looked into this whole thing so this whole thing is a well oiled machine one of these billionaire um, foundations will go and fund these studies then those studies will show if either nutrition nahi hai vitamin d deficiency whatever whatever it is the latest thing that you want to sell to india and then it will be then next stage will be it will come out even more sensationalized in the uh, press so what will happen is that public perception will be built up for a certain povertarian narrative and then that pressure will be used to carry out certain uh, policy interventions which you know are useful to whoever was the original uh, funder of the project and so you'll be sold medicines you will be sold baby food you will be sold uh, all kinds of things and by the way this is a very long history to this this is not a new phenomena this has been going on at least from independence and we know that all the baby food companies are american companies uh, yeah but you know i can tell you that this thing is a very old thing and I'll, there are many well known phenomena in india which have its origins in this Uh, ecosystem of research uh, done by funded by these foreign agencies and uh, then certain outcomes which are then inter- interestingly those outcomes are then f- criticized by the same funding agencies for other purposes and i'll give you one example which is fully documented so i want you to know this because it is a fully documented thing we all know that even now but is uh, till very recently we had a serious problem with uh, gender selective abortion yes. huh and because of which particularly in some of these northwestern states there was a serious uh, imbalance in the number of uh, boys being born uh, much in excess of the number of girls right yeah you all know this and india has been much criticized for this haryana has been haryana been particularly punjab western up this is basically the zone where this happens and basically we are told this is because of Uh, you know our inborn cultural uh, patriarchy uh, evil indian customs etc now let me tell you the actual origin of this back in the 1960s 50s and 60s there were a series of articles in western uh, journals uh, talking about how non white populations were growing very fast and then they would overwhelm the world so it was purely i mean quite offensively racist they didn't realize we would read them today but they are quite blatant about the fact that their main problem is that non white populations are growing very fast so it was decided by various departments at that time uh, geopolitical uh, powers of that time that there something had to be done about this because otherwise the world would be taken over by these uh, uh, brown and uh, looking people uh, <clears throat> so a huge effort was done ki let us intervene in these countries to have population control so how were they going to do this so they decided that look the number of men does not actually matter it is the number of women that matters 
because they are the you can have uh, uh, only one man and uh, you can still have population growth if uh, and number, number, number of women number. are there so <clears throat> therefore uh, we need to do something about reducing the number of girls being born so here came the thought that what you can do is to weaponize son preference in traditional societies now all traditional societies have son preference not nothing new even the west before they developed had a preference for sons which is you know they are needed for work they are needed for war and so on so there is a son preference but it's quite different from what happened next so basically they came to india and they sold this idea to the indian authorities in the 19 uh, late 60s and 70s of course in the emergency had nasbandi etc but the thing in which they really focused was something quite different they basically these whole bunch of these rockefeller ford even some un agencies were involved in this and they basically imported with their funding uh, ultrasound machines and they basically said that look this is great why don't you allow parents to actually choose their child so now you are weaponizing a son preference and they know why they are doing this yeah then the first several thousand of these sex selection abortions were happened in aims the doctors who carried out those operations with full support from these international agencies they are still alive and this is all well documented and then in the late 70s and early 80s they began to spread this message so they were began to you know these so called uh, these ngos got into their cars in those days uh, suvs were quite rare so they were the only people who used to have these large suvs and their white colored suvs from lodi road they drove out in different directions and if you then look at where the gender imbalances were the worst after after that in the 80s 90s and so on so they would go it north. was in those in those along those highways leading out of lodi road now all of this is very well documented if you there's a book called uh, unnatural selection by a uh, pulitzer winning journalist called mara wesenthal you can get her book on amazon all of this is well documented that this this whole gen- sex selection operation was funded by these agencies um in india and these ultrasounds were brought in the doctors were trained the operations actually happened in aims and when it began to cause this imbalance in birth who was blamed indian culture okay and then the same agencies now have entire departments telling us how you know we should uh, have better xyz for women so what did they manage to do they were first of all manipulating our population they were creating a market for their ultrasound machines ha huh? so the same thing happens when you hear you know uh, there is a, 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 you know huge uh, problem with vitamin d de- deficiency this and that. always be very suspicious about where these studies are being conducted because essentially what is happening you you are being manipulated and going back to our earlier point your aspirations are also being manipulated and so we really don't know right where this poverty of aspiration it can be a theory it might have come from the west no no so some part of it is of course i mean you are told that you should not aspire to have billionaires right you are told ki oh my god look you are um, you have such uh, poverty you should not have billionaires you adani ambani not today adani ambani 20 years ago 30 years ago and i was growing up we used to hear tata birla right but my view is why shouldn't indians be billionaires we are one sixth of the world's population one sixth of the world's billionaires should live in india right after all all the ngos that scream so much about this billionaire problem all of them are actually funded by western billionaires ha ah, soros's open society ha ah, omidyar ford rockefeller kon hai ye sab billionaire hain ha ah, the problem is not with gora billionaires if the billionaires is white it's perfectly fine it's with brown billionaires they have a problem why do they have a problem with brown billionaires i can give you one example right which is hmm. closer to the venture capital world the omidyar established the omidyar fund back like 15 years ago to fund the poor population of india recently they closed the fund in india and went back and they had huge like 50 to 100 employees for a fund it's large hmm. and the reason was the india doesn't need us 
it's not that india doesn't need us the india has stopped listening to their narrative absolutely we have stopped listening to their narrative they were trying to manipulate us and they were called out yeah. that is all there is to it yeah. and the same thing is happening so going back to this point of zero food please go and look at who funded it that paper tells you who funded it and they are the same people who fund similar studies and other things and so it is shocking that this not only is the problem of poverty of uh, aspiration very often this poverty of aspiration is slowly seeped into you a certain true movies yeah you look at the kinds of movies of india indian movies that will be given awards wahi povertarian wale yeah aap garibi bolenge to aapko nobel prize bhi milega ha aap garibi bolenge to this is basically fed back into you that we should aspire for poverty yeah like mother india was such a called out movie though it was a brilliant movie hmm. but it received international honors back in its day hmm. because it was called like it showed the poverty of india no but at least in those days we were that poor yeah. today we are no way near yeah. that poor yeah. so this this change that you're seeing in india is a lot to do with the changes that are happening in our own heads and the heroes we are choosing now absolutely so the changes in our own heads and the aspirations we have we now say that we will build a better parliament we will build uh, the world's largest office complex we will go to the moon and at every stage notice these same people will come and tell you are why you are a poor country why do you want to do this yes we want to do it in fact you know the average uh, uh, auto driver who is very poor also feels a certain sense of pride that uh, india is sending a, a satellite to the moon right so why does he feel it because his aspirations have changed and so if you look at india as a map you will see you can clearly see the difference of uh, economic success is directly correlated to aspirational success so i'll tell you one incident i was recently in us in los angeles there's a summit called montgomery summit and it's held by montgomery family which is a billionaire family on every slide the fam- the first slide was presented by the family the 30 slide so every slide had india at its forefront they are saying them absolutely so that is a change that is a change we could have done this a generation ago maybe two generations yeah. ago but we didn't because our aspiration was ki hum gareeb rahenge yeah and coming to a diatomy right which people call we want to build the best temples in india the largest the magnificent temples and the best government buildings now and we are tearing up our old government buildings why is that it's the same logic so if you if you see go to shastri bhavan yeah. then you'll understand the poverty of aspiration these were not built in the 50s yeah. now the government buildings of the previous generation which the 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 british had built yeah. look at them north block and south block whatever it may be they had genuine imperial ambitions and they expressed it right so you can disagree with Uh, their colonial policies and all that but you cannot say that from their perspective they were not ambitious and that you know they as- aspired to signal power and whatever whatever it is that they were doing they did what did we aspire we aspired for building these concrete small concrete cpwd construction go to shastri bhavan or nirman bhavan or any number of other bhavans in delhi and this is central government yeah. state government ke to chhodi dijiye yeah. from 1947 till the now very recent building of the new parliament tell me one genuine serious building that post independence india built none right wo ek vidhan sauda building banaya tha bangalore mein which is okay it's a decent size building but you know there will be the very very few really uh, you know great buildings it's only in recent times that we have begun to aspire to build big so this is and the aspiration we have so the same thing when we tear down uh, these uh, old government buildings what is the aspiration we have ki wo narrow lanes honge uske andar uh, bureaucrats baithenge wo wo uh, wahan um, uh, air conditioner hoga usme se dripping hoga the whole uh, and then you when you walk down those damp corridors you will be Uh, you can smell the toilet from anywhere along that is our aspiration right so it's not that people at that time didn't know how to build better because just a generation earlier they had built north block and south block ha huh? 
these are same people whose forefathers had built uh, you know uh, the meenakshi temple and uh, taj mahal etc so it's not like indians didn't know how to construct good buildings so why is it that we built shastri bhavan so the tearing down of shastri bhavan is the tearing down of a block in our head and it's an important thing to tear these buildings down because otherwise we were we will be caught in that and not only will we be caught in that we will be also encouraged to think that that is all we can aspire to so this and then when we have not succeeded rather than blame this poverty aspiration you will be blame other things you know uh, even by the 70s our economic growth was quite obviously floundering but who was blamed did we blame nehru or uh, socialism no we blamed hinduism hindu rate of growth and it's a very interesting thing like the west is criticizing india for building the statue of sardar vallabh bhai patel huh. they're in the saying it's not economically efficient and you could have realized taxes better but now we have bill gates coming in india and posing a video in front of sardar vallabh bhai patel and now they're praising it no no the point of the matter is they want us to go to america stand in front of statue of liberty yeah. and do a selfie yeah. yeah if we do it in front of a building that we built that is their problem इंडिया में भी अगर कर रहे हो तो इट इज ओके टू डू इट इन फ्रंट ऑफ विक्टोरिया टर्मिनस बिकॉज दे बिल्ट इट इफ वी बिल्ट इट डू इट इन फ्रंट ऑफ वन समथिंग वी बिल्ट देन देर इज अ प्रॉब्लम एंड प्रॉब्ली आई थिंक इट विल टेक सम टाइम टू गेट ओवर ब्राउन बिलियनियर्स नो आई थिंक इट विल हैपन फास्टर देन यू थिंक आफ्टर ऑल दे क्विकली एक्सेप्टेड चाइनीज एंड जैपनीज बिलियनियर्स दे हैव नो प्रॉब्लम विथ अरब शेख्स so they'll get used to indian billionaires also in fact we need to get used to indian billionaires our problem is not that indian billionaires but our problem is we don't have enough of them i want more billionaires new first generation billionaires they will generate the jobs they will generate the uh, the, the 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 energy and there should be continuous churn of them i think it's then it's not just a problem of bengal having the poverty of aspiration even bihar and kerala both of these states have followed the same and ended up having the same set of leaders yeah i mean bihar as i said the, what was the, just like bengal aspired to pseudo intellectuals and uh, union leaders bihar aspired to small time local goon politicians or upsc or upsc yeah so in in an environment where those are the role models you can either either you can become a local goon if you don't want to become a local goon you know your way out is to basically become a, a civil servant now even that although it's better than being a goon even that is a poverty of aspiration i mean at the end of it why you know if you must dream surely you should dream to be elon musk or mukesh ambani why did you dream to be joint secretary yeah or you not dreaming to be sachin and bini bansal of flipkart yeah so that's the point i'm making so you need to uh you know think about uh, how a society thinks about uh, risk taking and scale and so on so i think one of the prob- one of the, the problems of uh, say a place like bihar is not that it had bad leaders the bad leaders are reflection of what that society aspires for so if you are aspiring for this you will get it so i think this what is happening thankfully is country across the country they are aspirations are changing now of course not everywhere i still think way too many young kids who have so much energy etc are wasting their time basically trying to crack the upsc yeah. i'm not saying you don't want people to take the exam yes every country needs a bureaucracy that's perfectly fine but i think lakhs of people spending their best years trying to crack an exam where a tiny number of few thousand people are actually going to get in makes no sense the same, if they put the same energy into doing something else you know we would be winning more olympic gold medals we would be seeing better movies being made we would see better doctors we would see more um, you know entrepreneurs uh, and scientists and so on so i i would say that same energy put into something else so i would say it's a it's a waste of time and i i always discourage people unless they really want to be you know a administrator they shouldn't take the ups exam i mean if they real because many of them after having gone through it then they get frustrated through the course of their career in the end 
you know, uh, uh, life and bureaucracy is not meant for everybody. And large parts of it, as with any profession, but large parts of it are largely dull and boring and about passing files up and down. Like you, um, and unless you really wanted to do it, and you, you, you know, you're not going to be particularly happy with it. I'll, I'll share one more anecdote with you right now. In India, it was unheard of that both husband and wife couples are entrepreneurs. That is now happening in hordes and hordes. So Indian society as a whole is giving up security as a notion. Why we claimed for UPSC or even 50,000 people lined up on a railway station for a few thousand police jobs, which has been recently right in Kanpur. And this, will ha this is still happening. But I'm trying to say it is changing. At least in the middle class, it has significantly changed. Uh, people are taking risks. And this is going back to my original point. This is an opening of mind, which does, is not just happening in that little space of entrepreneurship. This is a change of attitude. And this change of attitude will manifest itself in everything. It will manifest itself in science. It will manifest itself in, um, uh, in music. Uh, in literature, I mean, there's an explosion of Indian, uh, you know, Indian literature as well. Uh, there is the all kinds of innovation will happen because we we will naturally live in this world where doing new things and so on is thought of being as a natural thing that you know people do and it is encouraged, uh, as opposed to uh, what happens even in inter Indian intellectual life, for example. One of the things that will strike you, true of Indian academia to this day that when you go through a certain argument, the argument is not ultimately won by virtue of the logic from first principles or from the evidence you bring. Ultimately, the argument is won by quoting authority. Ki Gandhi ji ne kaha tha, or Ambedkar ne kaha tha, whoever happens to be your favorite great. Okay, That is a society that is not thinking uh, uh, in an expanding way. It has already decided that the ultimate has been said already by somebody, and that is the limits of knowledge. And as you mentioned, right, our poverty of aspiration led us to cling on to Gandhi ji. Gandhi ne ka vyapari bura hai, ya profit bura hai. Jo bhi hai. Point of the matter is that is a, that is essentially a society that is not progressing. It is already jammed up because you have already defined uh, what is uh, progress by some great whoever happens to be your great. <laughs> And we have, uh, we have in the last 25 years, case studies of cities like Mumbai, Bangalore, Hyderabad, obviously New Delhi, Gurgaon, getting developed. But in the recent past itself, like Uttar Pradesh is changing its image dramatically. Yes, so that's why. So sometimes you need to actually do an external shock, so to speak, to begin to change that dynamics. And I think you are seeing that in a place like Eastern UP. Uh, Western UP, Thika, Noida, Vaida, every, they have access, access to Delhi. Delhi. They anyway were coming out of that. But I think what is happening now is very visible in Eastern UP. It um, uh, started, of course, with Varanasi. But now with, uh, if you look at Ayodhya, new airport, uh, the kind, you know, a big new temple. Uh, and so the, the changing dynamics of that is quite, uh, you know, quite visible. The highways that are going through, the train stations. We are no longer thinking in small scale, you know, thinking in stuff that, you know, our great-grandchildren will be proud to look at. That's how we think about it now. First time. And Gujarat building is the first gift city of India. Yeah, yeah. So what I'm trying to say at every level, we try to do something. Now, not all of this will succeed. Not all of this will be great. Some of it will be rubbish. It's okay. And some of it will be pulled down. But you see, we don't start with the thing that we are poor, so we are poor, we are poor, we are poor, and we are poor. So that we have broken out of. Yeah. And it's, it's wonderful to see, right? Even the West is trying to pull India down. Let's say, for example, I don't know whether it's truth or false. Hindenburg published the report on Adani. Look, there are people who will support India's rise and there are people who will find that threatening. That is the nature of being. So we, have to be, we have to allow for the fact that this we are changing the dynamics of the world. There will be people who will benefit and they will applaud and there will be who will try to push us down. So... In the same country, there will be different groups and different things. So if you go to the US, for example, there are people who will, you know, who are enthusiastic about India. They will be want to invest in India. They want to help us. There are um, Indian diaspora uh, who is very excited about it. And then there are others who will find it threatening. 
including members, by the way, of the Indian diaspora, who had created this entire uh, ecosystem uh, based on essentially milking India's poverty for whatever projects and so on. There'll be members of the old elite of India who are no longer find themselves relevant, whatever it may be. So the, it's not just that, that uh, you know, there will be members of our own who will feel threatened by this. So thank you so much, sir. It's been a wonderful discussion. I think poverty of aspiration is such a highlighted topic that we need to educate our youth on that. Choose your heroes wisely if you choose your Absolutely. heroes. Absolutely. The, the, the best scientists. The danger is that you very often you will end up uh, increasing like the heroes you choose. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks a lot, sir. Thank you. It's been a pleasure hosting you second time on the Neon Show. Such an honor.